Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I can. Right. Yeah, um, shall we start? Uh, I think the time is about 10 o'clock and um, let's start the session. Again, uh, thank you everyone for joining this session. This is the Research Rockstar Tour series, the final of uh, the Rock, uh, Research Rockstar Tour uh, for the year of 2021. And uh, for this session, it's uh, actually uh, a co-session um, together with the Faculty of Medicine. Um, we intended to have this initially when we when we thought about this, uh, to do this physically face to face. Therefore, uh, we will be bringing this to all the faculties. Unfortunately, we went into a lockdown then and uh, this has been online ever since. So maybe next year, we shall bring this as a face to face forum again. Uh, so that we can meet each other physically. But um, nevertheless, uh, I think we've done quite well in terms of uh, trying to get researchers to increase the visibility as well as having more interdisciplinary kind of research, getting to know other researchers uh, work as well as uh, trying to also explain what we have done uh, to the rest of uh, uh, the other faculties. Um, a bit about housekeeping rule, the session will be recorded and we will then upload this session into our um, UM research uh, social media. And um, to all the other participants, um, as for now, you'll be muted, but uh, if you wish to ask questions, you can raise your hand at the, or, or just use the hand icon um, at the end of the session after all the speakers have presented their presentation. And um, for this session, we've uh, taken the title or the team coexisting with COVID-19. Are we there yet? And the idea is to explore the state of science on the current COVID-19 pandemic in the country, in Malaysia, as well as globally, and with a specific focus on how best to mitigate its impact. And I think all of us know that with regard to COVID-19, the first case that happened in Malaysia was in uh, March, uh, sorry, in, in uh, January 2020, uh, one of our international visitors and following that, there was a sharp cases, uh, rise in cases in March 2020, and the country then went under MCO uh, or PKP, and there were then several types of MCO, being the CMCO, RMCO, and uh, cases then were really low in, in, uh, in that period in 2020. But then there was a rise, a sharp rise in number of cases again at the end of 2020, and again, we went into another round of MCO 2.0, uh, in early 2021 and multiple um, uh, uh, multiple abbreviations of uh, PKP or MCO. And then uh, Delta, Delta hit us. Uh, I think all of us know about Delta. So there were lots of things that happened in this year as well as last year. So I hope that um, from the speakers, we'll be hearing uh, things about what are the lessons to be learned in the last 24 months and what are we what can we prepare ourselves in the future of the the coming 2022 i guess in a in a nutshell um what i can say is that in the last 24 months what we have learned from covid-19 pandemic is that humans or we ourselves are more vulnerable than what we thought we were covid-19 infection rates actually usually grows slowly then exponentially, oh, that's terrifying. A delayed response lead to tragic consequences and tragic consequences actually include massive loss of lives as well as human suffering in, in many sense. So we hope to listen to our three uh, speakers. We have Professor Dr. Dr. Professor Dr. Awam Bugi Bawang Mahmud from the Faculty of Medicine. We also have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Nohayati Mahudin from the Department of Building Surveying, Faculty of Built Environment, and Professor Dr. Muhammad Roslan Muhammad Noor from the Department of Islamic History and Civilization, Academic of Islamic Studies, to share their thoughts on COVID-19, coexisting with COVID-19. Um, so without further ado, let me welcome all of you. And uh, I would also like to invite Professor Dr. Sanji Rampal, uh, the Deputy Dean for Research of Faculty of Medicine to say a few words on our welcoming remarks. Over to you, Sanji. Thank you, Prof Noran. So first of all, I would like to thank the Health and Wellbeing Research Cluster for inviting the Faculty of Medicine to co-organize this session. So this is a very important session as, as Prof Noran has stated. I would also like to welcome all the panelists uh, 
Datuk Profesor Dr. Awang Bulgiba, Associate Professor Dr. Uh, Noor Hayati, and also Prof. Dr. Mohamed Roslan. Now, I think this is a very timely topic um, because the, uh, number one, COVID is not going anywhere. The virus is, is, is staying here for, and looks to be going to be here for a long time, right? And it's actually very interesting because this there's a lot of infodemic and the infodemic appears to continue throughout this year. And the media monitors the daily reported cases like the stock market. And it's interesting because the stock market, it goes up one point and there's a big hoo-ha about it going up. It goes down a few points and there's a, still a big hoo-ha about it. And that's what our media seems to be doing at the moment. And there's still a lot of fear by the rakyat, right? And there's a lot of fear about further lockdowns. And I'm sure our panelists will be talking about it. Uh, in general, I think as a society, we have generally maladapted to this pandemic, but the messaging by the government has appears to be improving over these past few months. The pandemic also highlights other problems with the society, a health system that has been chronically underfunded, a weak government with weak political power, an inequitable society, and a large number of undocumented migrants, I think, and weak border controls. So uh, I wouldn't want to go and speak more on this topic as we have very, very good and experienced experts here to talk. So with that, thank you once again to the Health and Wellbeing Research Cluster for allowing us to co-organize this very important and very timely topic. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Sanjay. Thank you so much to the Faculty of Medicine. And we hope to do more of this in the future because like you said, COVID-19 is not going anywhere. It's going to be together with us and we need to live or to coexist with this virus. And how do we do that? That's the million dollar question, right? So um, next, I would uh, pass the session to Associate Professor Dr. Siti Nadia Abdul Halim. She's the Deputy Dean for Health and Wellbeing Research Cluster. She'll be moderating this session. Over to you, Nadia. Okay, thank you so much, Prof Nuran. Assalamualaikum, selamat sejahtera and a very good morning, everyone. So uh, for today, <clears throat> as mentioned by Prof Nuran, we have three panelists for the forum um, where they are from different background. And uh, the first speaker that I would like to introduce to everybody is Datuk Professor Dr Awang Bulgiba bin, bin Awang Mahmud, where he is the first Malaysian doctor to gain a PhD in health informatics. Uh, where Datuk Professor Dr. Awang Bulgiba Awang Mahmud is currently Secretary General for the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, Council Member for the Academy of Medicine Malaysia, and President of the Malaysian Chapter for the Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health. He currently leads the Independent COVID-19 Vaccination Advisory Committee, ICVAC, in Malaysia and research project called CEASE, COVID-19 Epidemiology Analysis and Strategies. So a few years ago, he led the formulation of Malaysia, Malaysia's National Policy of Science, Technology and Innovation, NPSTI 2021-2030, which was launched in 2021, and a Mohe playbook called Strengthening Academic Career Pathways and Leadership Development, a book used for the University Transformation Program in Malaysia. Professor Awang Bulgiba was awarded the Ma'al Hijrah Award for Outstanding Achievements in Research and Development in 2013 by the Sarawak State Government, the UM Eminent Scholar Award, and the Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health, APACPH, Excellence in Leadership Medallion, both in 2018. So without further ado, um, Professor Awang, Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, OK. Uh, let me just uh, share my slides. Uh, hang on. Right. Can you uh, see my slides? Right, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everybody. Now, I, I'm not sure why this series are called uh, uh, Research rock star. I don't think I'm a, a rock star by any by any measure, but uh, I do have uh, certain uh, experiences with COVID-19, and uh, maybe it's, it's time that we we share some of these experiences with uh, people in UM. 
Now, I, I don't have a lot of slides. And uh, I was given this topic called coexisting with COVID-19. I'll be there yet. So these slides are not about to lecture you on, on COVID-19, but uh, on the issues uh, to do with uh, working together with people from, from other backgrounds and, and so on. Is my slide moving? This is, should be the second slide now. Right, thank you very much. So this outline of uh, my slides, I've only got 15 minutes. So I've uh, got nine effective slides. There are more than nine slides, but there are only nine effective slides. So I'm going to start off with expertise and we explain what public health professionals do, um, interdisciplinary research projects which are done in public health, uh, my own contributions in, the, uh, in this pandemic and the challenges of uh, working with a multidisciplinary team as well as overcoming those challenges. And then uh, just very briefly what the issues with the COVID-19 management are so far, uh, and then whether we are there yet and factors affecting uh, future scenarios. Now, uh, I must say this is not the first time I'm talking about coexisting with COVID-19. In fact, last month, at the end of last month, I was invited by the uh, Sarawak Civil Service to talk about coexisting with COVID-19. <laughs> so I had a whole hour to talk about uh, uh, what are the things that we should expect and the kind of scenario planning that the uh, the state civil service needed to do in order to uh, cope with uh, COVID-19. Okay, this is just a little bit the background about myself, my own expertise. I'm an epidemiologist and health informatician. Uh, I do have a degree in applied uh, statistics also in addition to all these. I'm quite conversant in epidemiological research methods. I'm conversant in some artificial intelligence methods used in health data research, not all of them, but some. Uh, my main job is to look at past data patterns and trends, discern future trends, and piece all of this together in a big picture view. Sometimes uh, uh, this is part of foresighting, meaning I have to do this without data. So you have to get a feel of what uh, the future looks like and uh, piece this together and puts this in pieces uh, in, in place where data is not uh, available. Now, uh, my own research is uh, focused mainly on infectious disease epidemiology. I do quite a bit on non-communicable diseases as far as uh, metabolism is concerned, uh, for example, on nutrition, uh, uh, what people do in nutrition. Uh, I've published widely with Prof Noran uh, on issues uh, concerned with aging, which is one of the four big challenges I believe uh, that Malaysia has to face. And there are a few papers on health informatics following my own PhD uh, in health informatics. But in reality, actually my, I, I, as a researcher, I'm not, I'm not a great researcher. I'm a, I'm a mediocre researcher, I think at, at, at best. I don't think I've ever had the uh, chance to fully develop my research skills. So my most important skill is my ability to bring people to work together to solve real world problems and to craft strategies and plans which which really work and uh, i mean plans which do really work they are not they're just theoretical in nature a little bit about public health professionals uh, we work around the world many of our own graduates we have more than a thousand um, public health graduates which work uh, in many 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 countries around the world including in many developing countries uh, we crunch numbers among other things uh, we also conduct lab, lab and, and field research and we address health problems of communities as a whole. So we don't look at single uh, person uh, patients. We look at whole communities to how to solve problems of communities. So when we say uh, solving problems of communities, inevitably we'll have to look work directly with people to help improve their health. But uh, more often than not, we formulate and influence policies that affect the health of society. So that we do a lot of work with policies. We do a lot of work with programs which affect uh, lots of people. So um, I think one of the uh, most apt uh, mottos for public health is probably from the uh, Bloomberg uh, School of Public Health in the, uh, where they say um, public health uh, uh, solving problems uh, one million at a time you know, uh, affecting one million people at a time. OK. Um, the thing about public health is that uh, whatever public health research that we do involves interdisciplinary research projects. So no public health problem can be solved without working with different people from different fields. So we don't work alone. We require inputs from many, many fields, some of them outside our own uh, 
uh, realm of public health. So public health research requires inputs from professionals in uh, epidemiology, like Prof Sanjay, he's an epidemiologist too, uh, people in medical and health statistics, uh, people in the lab sciences, people in the health policy and management, social and behavioral sciences. That's why my department is called social and preventive medicine. So we do a lot of social medicine. We do, we have to understand how people work because people are not machines and, and they respond uh, differently in different behaviors to whatever interventions we put up. We do a lot of work in health education because uh, no matter what you do, if people don't understand what you're trying to to uh, to put forward, if they're not uh, literate enough uh, in health literacy, they're not well educated in health uh, in health matters, then they are not likely to to do what you ask them to do. We do uh, work with people with nutrition, dietetics, uh, uh, nursing uh, sciences, uh, health informatics, which is becoming very important now because of big data and so on. Health economics, because this has got to do with uh, with money. Whatever big programs that you put up, you require money and you need to know how effective uh, the, the money that you put in is, uh, how beneficial it is. So we, we have to know uh, cost effective analysis, for example, cost benefit analysis and so on. We do work with people in clinical medicine. We do work with activists who advocate uh, changes in programs. So for example, uh, people who uh, advocate changes in the laws, for example, to do with aging, for example. This is something which is creeping up on, on Malaysia, but uh, not much action has been taken. Uh, hopefully in the near future, we'll see some progress. Uh, physical therapy, we will work with uh, people also in demography and uh, very importantly, not to be left out, uh, people who work in ethics because the, there are a lot of interventions which require uh, an ethical point of view. Are they ethical or not? Should we carry them out uh, or not? I have been involved uh, in this pandemic uh, right from the very beginning, I think from March last year. I'm a PI of uh, this project called CEAS, C -E -A -S -E. Uh, it stands for COVID-19 Epidemiological Analysis and Strategies. This is funded by MOSTI. Um, involves uh, a lot of people for very small funding. Um, there's about 40 plus persons from five universities and two ministries. They involve people who are from the epidemiology background, statisticians, economists, commissioner health physicians, dietitians, IT specialists, and so on. And we produce analysis and advocate strategies for government. Not all the things that we advocate have been taken up by government, but we have tried uh, in as, as much as possible. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, presenting to different ministers uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic when the MCO uh, started on what we expected, the uh, how we expected the pandemic to to turn out. And uh, we did predict a number of things which have turned out to, to be true. For example, multiple waves of uh, infections. Uh, we did predict that. We did predict that we might have as many as 30,000 deaths um, over the course of a year. Well, we are close to 30,000 deaths now. We thought that we have thousands, uh, we have millions of uh, infected people, and it turned out that we, we did have millions of infected people and so on. So that's uh, CIS. It's still going on. Um, we have had to scale down our project somewhat, and it's been a challenge trying to work with, with uh, people from uh, different backgrounds with uh, CIS, uh, particularly from the Ministry of Health. The second one, I'm chair of this uh, independent committee. I have to stress it's, it's, it's an independent committee. It's called the ICVAC, Independent COVID-19 Vaccination Advisory Committee, appointed by MOSTI. So we have official appointment letters. We've got nine people from three different universities. Uh, so I, I lead this uh, committee. I have to uh, say right from the outset, we do not recommend vaccines for the government. So we don't evaluate the uh, vaccines for the government. That was done by uh, uh, Ministry of Health uh, Committee. However, we have recommended many things about the vaccination plan, the program, the how to carry out the vaccination, uh, what's the coverage that we, the target coverage that we should have. So, for example, uh, we everybody talks about that 80% uh, target uh, that was recommended by us, uh, uh, vastly different from what the Ministry of Health recommended, uh, which recommended only 60% coverage at that time. So we have recommended a lot of things uh, to the government. We have, uh, uh, most of our recommendations have been taken up, but uh, there are one or two recommendations which have not been taken up, which uh, we hope that in future the government will take them up. 
because if we, we they are not taken up, I think we will not be able to manage the vaccination uh, as well as we should. And the third, um, the, I've, I've been cited in uh, many media articles. There are almost 400 now. Uh, I think about three more uh, reached 400 media articles. I've appeared more than 40 times in TV and radio. I've uh, hardly appeared on uh, TV and radio this year to talk about COVID. It gets tiring after a time, uh, after some time, to talk about the same thing on TV and radio. And so I, I think it, it's time for other people to talk about that. I've spoken in more than 30 conferences and webinars to do with COVID since the pandemic started, and it's still going on. Uh, I think this is the 18th uh, uh, webinar this year. Uh, the 18th. This is the 17th. I got one more to go uh, before the year is over. And uh, for next year, there are already uh, webinars being lined up. Uh, as far as uh, COVID is concerned. All right, so that's my own uh, contributions in, in COVID. Um, there are a few challenges which I found when working over the years, uh, working with multidisciplinary teams. People come from various agencies, they come from different backgrounds, may have different views of the same thing. So we may have, we will have to to accommodate their views and, and see where we can come to, a, to an understanding. Secondly, there be uh, there's bound to be misunderstanding of roles and objectives or whatever projects that you have when you have uh, people from multiple disciplines. Thirdly, um, some organizations, we have to understand that they are quite inward looking, so uh, they don't know how to collaborate with other people. So we'll have to to understand that uh, when that happens and, and try to uh, look for a way to, to overcome this uh, inward looking attitude. Fourthly, um, in my understanding in Malaysia, there's a lot of understanding of open science, which is very unfortunate. This is something that the Academy of Sciences hope to solve uh, through the Malaysia Open Science uh, Project, where we try to to make data more accessible to people so that uh, it's easier for us to to come up with policies and uh, and plans which uh, are truly evidence based in in, uh, in nature. Uh, fifth. Uh, you may find there is a lack of urgency in some people in meeting deadlines. Uh, this is understandable and when they may not understand that uh, yeah. deadlines are there for a reason, so uh, we'll have to find a way around it. And six, uh, there's a great challenge in managing budgets across uh, organizations. So you may have a small pot of money, but uh, you have to manage that budget between various universities and, and so on. So how do you apportion that? And how do you move uh, money around such that you achieve all the uh, objectives? Okay, can you see this slide? Overcoming challenges. Right, thank you. Right, uh, how do you overcome these challenges? Firstly, I think personal touch, diplomacy, and tech is necessary. Now, challenges, of course, easy to address when you know people personally and you have dealt with them before. So, this personal relationship is is important. If you do uh, but in, in, in many cases, uh, you may not know the, these people personally, so you'll have to, uh, have to work your way around and, uh, and use your own diplomacy and, and tech to try to, to get things done. You must understand the organization that you're working with. Um, they're not the same as an academic organization, for example, or even if they are an academic organization, it's from a different culture, so you have to understand that, that organization. So. It's best to try to find a common ground and uh, build on that. Uh, no point arguing over petty details and so on, but find the common ground first uh, and be built on, on that common ground. It is best to lay ground rules from the very beginning. So you people are on the same page. They understand what, uh, what, what you mean when you say this and then what you say that and so on. And you understand what they mean also when they say this and that. So th those ground rules have to be laid from the very beginning. Because there's bound to be uh, glitches, there's bound, there are bound to be obstacles along the way. I always believe in a plan B and a plan C, and if necessary, a plan D to deal with these uh, uh, challenges. Uh, you should be ready to go the extra mile, meaning uh, you may have to uh, accommodate. So you have to be uh, flexible, perhaps in, in some ways, to try to, to get things done. However, and this is something which I, I always uh, I have to stress, do not 
sacrifice your project and your internal collaborators trust just for the sake of maintaining good relations with external collaborators. Remember, your internal collaborators are people that you have to live with for a very long time. Your external collaborators come and go. So if you're just uh, for the sake of maintaining uh, good relations with external collaborators, you sacrifice the, uh, the trust and the good relationship that you built up with your internal collaborators, you're going to face problems for the future. So do not sacrifice that for just for the sake of maintaining good collaborations. Uh, uh, if your external collaborators uh, make a impossible demands, which are clearly impossible and cannot be fulfilled, I think it's time to draw the line and say that, OK, we, we can just cannot uh, go on uh, like this. And so, so we we have to be clear uh, from the very beginning. I've had uh, uh, the unfortunate uh, experience of having to deal with some of this uh, over the years. Now, in Wisma R&D on the almost top floor, I think next to top floor, there's a cube in Wisma R&D um, that was built during the time when I was the uh, TNC PNI. Uh, and there are, there are a number of sayings which are plastered on the walls of the cubes. Uh, you'll find uh, uh, these sayings, they, they come from me. They come actually from my uh, inaugural lecture uh, and, and so on. Um, and one of these uh, sayings is, is dream big, uh, work hard, stay focused, and surround yourself uh, with good people. I think um, I tried to do this uh, all throughout my career. So you have to dream things which are, may seem impossible, but uh, because they are so big, um, they tend to scare people. So I have another saying uh, which I've adopted from somewhere. If your dreams don't scare you, they're, they're not big enough. And uh, you really have to work hard um, to, to do things. Uh, so of course, you, you should work smart. And there's another of, of my my own uh, philosophies where uh, where you work not only hard, but you work smart. And you should stay focused on what you're supposed to do. Don't get uh, distracted by things which are uh, trivial and so on. And in order to achieve uh, the organization's objectives, you have to surround yourself with good people, people who who are like-minded, uh, stay, uh, not, not uh, they are not yes men or yes persons, but uh, they they have the courage to tell you where you're going wrong, where we should uh, uh, change and so on. And you also must have the courage to listen to those uh, good people. So you have to surround yourself with good people, not yes men, but with good people. So what's my opinion with our COVID-19 management? Unfortunately, um, I don't have, I've, I haven't had really good opinions about the overall COVID-19 management in this country for a long while. Um, we hope things will change uh, or are changing. Uh, there, are, there are two big things which, are, which I feel which, which are wrong. One is the overall uh, pandemic management strategy is unclear. Uh, there has been that from the very beginning. We have had poor data collection. Uh, we have a lack of early warning system, which I've uh, advocated again and again, but uh, uh, people have not listened to that. And uh, our approach to uh, COVID-19 has been reactive rather than proactive. So we wait for something to happen rather than trying to uh, to nip it in the bud. And uh, this whole of nation approach uh, to COVID-19, uh, unfortunately, uh, is mere lip service in, in my, my opinion. Uh, there is no whole of nation approach. If it's a whole of nation approach, uh, we'd have approached things quite differently. And it's a very close data approach, something which uh, I've uh, emphasized uh, to, to three ministers right in March last year that our data approach has to be open rather than close. So without making use of the experts outside the traditional ministries, uh, we will not be able to optimize the data that we have. We don't have clear direction or clear stages and abrupt changes take uh, place without warning or rationale. We hope that uh, it is changing. There are signs that uh, this may be changing uh, now. The second big issue is, of course, poor crisis management. We have uh, had poor and confusing messaging. Uh, there's still poor and confusing messaging. In fact, somebody uh, asked me last night about, about quarantine um, for uh, people who have been vaccinated uh, and when they should do their, their tests, as, as, uh, uh, whether it should be day five or should, and they can, can they go off on day five uh, if they're 
the test becomes negative and, and so on. And uh, unfortunately, the messaging is still uh, very confusing because what is written in the in the guideline is different from in the infographics. So the infographics seems to be an updated version of the written guidelines, which is, which is really unfortunate. There are sometimes contradictory messaging and uh, sometimes the messaging between different health departments is very different. And a very unfortunate, again, uh, something which I've said before, there doesn't to be much, seem to be much engagement with behavioral and communication experts. So um, we assume that people understand whatever messages we put up, but that's not true. People are people. They have uh, different levels of health literacy and so on. And double standards actually really do not help with trust. Uh, so double standards lead to a distrust of uh, official uh, messages. So in the question, are we there yet? Whether we are there remains to be seen. So um, there may mean an endemic state. And unfortunately, when people talk about an endemic state, they assume that we are in endemic state. But that's not really true. You don't say you're in an endemic state because uh, you, you say so. There must be a constant level of disease over a sufficiently long period of time. So you have to demonstrate an endemic state. So endemic state does not happen just because you declare it to be so. So well, whether COVID-19 may become endemic or not, it may become endemic, but this constant level of infection has yet to be established. So there, there is not well defined as yet. This is a interesting uh, infographic from the World Economic Forum. What's the difference between endemic, epidemic, and, and pandemic? So I think to sum it up, what's endemic, what's epidemic, what's uh, a, a pandemic? You can have a look. So in the in my last uh, uh, webinar, um, not my last webinar, the, uh, at the end of last month, I had a uh, webinar with the Sarawak civil, uh, civil Service and I gave them seven different scenarios which might happen in the future. And they are, these are factors which uh, might affect future scenarios as far as COVID-19 is concerned. And they depend on, on the vaccines, depend on the treatments, whether there will be intermittent outbreaks and it depend on the, the virus mutation. So whether this will remain, uh, will become endemic or not and what kind of future scenario will I face. So let me just end this by saying this. This is another of our of the sayings which I picked up. It's just not my saying. It's some something on from the internet which I picked up. I believe that our background and circumstances may have influenced who we are, but uh, we are responsible for who we become. Thank you very much. Take care and stay safe. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Awang. Um, I hope you can stay with us towards the end uh, of the presentation uh, for the Q&A session. Yeah? Thank you so much again. OK, so now moving on to our second panelist, uh, which is Associate Professor Dr. S. R. Nur Hayati Mahyudin. So she holds a degree from the University of Science Malaysia in Housing, Building and Planning, majoring in Architecture and obtained Masters in Integrated Design Construction Management from University of Technology Mara in 2002. In 2011, she was awarded a PhD degree from University of Reading, United Kingdom, under the Indoor Environment and Energy Research Group. She is currently a registered building surveyor and a member of Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors Malaysia. She is an accomplished researcher with an exceptional track record of research success. Her research interests include indoor environment, quality, building performance, sustainable built environment, and computational fluid dynamics. Uh, in addition, she was an associate editor in chief for the Journal of Design and Built Environment, JDBE, and head of a research unit, Building and Science Performance. Presently, she is a member of the Syrian's Technical Committee serving an, as, as, a, as an expert advisor, ISO, on IAQ and workplace atmospheres. In a non-governmental organization, NGO, she currently served as a Secretary General for the Clean Air Forum Society of Malaysia, MICAS, 2016 to 2021. 
The quality of her work has led to many awards and recognition, such as uh, Malaysia University of Malaya Excellent Service Award and Excellent Service Certificate in the Hitachi Research Fellowship Award from the Hitachi Scholarship Foundation Japan. She also obtained two gold awards at the International Research Innovation in the Invention Solution Exposition, University of Malaya in 2018, and another gold and bronze award at the sixth Gen International Innovation, Invention and Design Competition in 2017. So recently, she had received the best presentation award by the Program Committee, International Science Council in London. So without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Associate Professor Dr. S.R. Nurhayati Mahyuddin for her presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, can you hear my voice clearly? Yes. All right, so I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. All right, so basically, um, thank you for inviting again, and I'm, I'm quite honoured to be here, uh, especially sitting, presenting in between the two prominent professors. And um, I'm nowhere near to that to Professor Aw uh, Awang, uh, and and um, I think um, he has actually mentioned about all the challenges and about the COVID-19. So what I'm just going to present today is uh, basically just giving some knowledge about uh, COVID-19 and whether or not we are at a safe environment, uh, whether we're in our office, in our classrooms, in our pantries, are we safe in that in that area? So these are the things that um, perhaps uh, just to uh, open up a bit, uh, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of how we feel when we sit uh, around people because nowadays I think uh, everybody is like quite nervous, uh, quite paranoid sitting with uh, people around you because we we don't know whether he or she is, you know, COVID positive or uh, is the ventilation uh, good enough, um, is the surface that we're touching is, you know, safe and clean. So everything th seems to be, you know, unusual. It's not like our normal life that we used to do and we can actually do any anything freely. So this is a topic that uh, I want to share about uh, reopening the workplace after COVID-19. Um, I believe that, you know, when UM call us back 100% to be in on site, I'm sure that, you know, uh, almost everybody was, uh, including me myself, <laughs> was saying, why do we have to go back uh, when we have, we can actually teach online? Um, is it going to be safe? Uh, are we going to be safe, uh, you know, teaching with the students in the classroom? Uh, 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 are you am ready, you know, with the, um, the the facilities and whatnot? So all these are, you know, uh, being uh, questioned uh, a lot by educators. But uh, for today, I'm just going to share a bit on a bit of information about COVID-19 and the workplace environment, uh, a safe return to normal with interdisciplinary action. And the most important bit is rethink ventilation for a safe return to a workplace. So, um, it's not going to be too long because we've only got 15 minutes uh, and uh, actually talking about ventilation, uh, it could take an hour, but I, I will try to simplify things. Uh, what we know and what we used to be uh, or what we used to, to, to be told and we believe is that when we wash our hands and we stay two meters away from uh, a person, then we should be safe. But uh, are we really safe by just doing that? It's becoming a culture which is good. We can see that our children, uh, people keep washing their hands, sanitizing their hands, uh, trying to be apart from other people, two meters apart, you know, talking at a very at a distance. But is that a safe, uh, you know, is that 100% safe to be as such? Because this is what we were told earlier on when the uh, first COVID uh, occurs. However, uh, what we don't know that makes uh, the increased numbers of COVID is that the uh, virus is basically an, uh, is an airborne. It is basically within the aerosols that we exhale. And it's very, very light that it can actually stay put in the indoor environment for a long time. Even if we are standing 
way away far from other people. See, this is the uh, COVID positive. Although we're staying like 10 meters away, uh, 20, 15 meters away in a room with a poor ventilation, we would uh, have, a, a, you know, a, there, there will be a risk uh, of us getting uh, the infection. And it, it's not just a matter of just standing in front of the people, uh, the person and touching the surface. It's within the environment. So when you're in the office, when you, you're uh, you know, surrounded with people in an environment, uh, don't feel uh, too comfortable, uh, although you know that you're standing away from another person, but uh, always keep in mind that there are possibilities that uh, you may be able to inhale the aerosols or airborne uh, that contain viruses uh, within your environment. So this is uh, something which uh, not many people aware of because uh, it, you, we used to be told only uh, washing your hands and stay away, but uh, not uh, mentioning about being in a room for a long time and also looking into whether the ventilation is uh, a, a, a efficient or a, appropriate or not. So a workplace is uh, can be defined as a building or room where people perform their jobs. So a workplace uh, does, doesn't mean that uh, people who go to work uh, as usual, your children who goes to school and the teachers that goes to school, that's also a workplace for them. Uh, the students that goes to the lecture halls or uh, uh, tutorial rooms, that's a workplace for them as well. And for us, our workplace is not solely in our room, our individual rooms, but uh, also when you enter the classroom, that's our workplace as well. So is our workplace safe? Uh, for us to be teaching our students. Uh, uh, of course, I think uh, most of us are already meeting our students physically and with 50% occupancy, but uh, are we still safe at this kind of environment? So this is something which we are still unsure because um, you know uh, we can't see what's happening in the air. And the only thing that we know is that uh, is already that when we have already got the symptom and whatnot. So this is something which is very crucial that uh, everybody should know, uh, especially for the building facilities, uh, building managers, uh, UM especially, um, to the JPPHB or to OSHI. Uh, are all our workplaces safe for the uh, staffs to be in for you know a, a period of time? Say when you have a lecture of two hours and three hours lectures, that's a long period of time where people stay in a room. Uh, we uh, inhaling like hundred hundred uh, hundred times or so more than hundred times because we know that when when we exhale it's like every four seconds we inhale and exhale every four seconds and every time it's accumulating if the ventilation is inappropriate so this is um, about the workplace and and when you talk about workplace we talk about classroom we talk about school children's we all have children's i mean most of us have children's and uh, we always uh, look into are they safe in their school's environment? You know, children, uh, although they understand that they need to wash uh, their hands, they need to be, uh, you know, social distancing, but uh, sometimes they are, uh, they, they tend to open their mask. The moment they open the mask, anything could happen depending on the ventilation. Because we adults sometimes do, do, do the same thing as well especially when you do a lecture, a two hours lecture. When I come into a lecture room, two hours, uh, I'm not sure if any of you uh, manage not to take off your mask at all. But I tried for two hours, but I can't because I feel a bit suffocated. And, you know, especially when you're teaching in front, you don't feel the, uh, the airflow coming to you and you, you tend to sweat a bit. So you tend to have, you know, once in a while to wipe your face. So that's our, uh, you know, the nature of, uh, it's just a, a nature that you just do it, uh, you know, um, unintentionally. So what more than the children in a school, which is the environment is hot and, uh, and you know, they don't like wearing the face mask. And you will see the tendency of them opening their mask at a longer period of time would be uh, occurring. So this infection is unavoidable, even though the schools have been provided with SOPs and guidelines. And, and one thing that I've seen is that the, the, the um, commentary and Pendidikan has actually uh, given a notice or a guideline to schools, uh, schools owners to ensure that the ventilation is good and uh, sufficient. But how do you know that 
the ventilation is sufficient. Even in our classrooms in UM, how do we know that our ventilation and our ventilation in our lecture rooms are sufficient? Is the air change rate per hour enough? I know if, if the air change rate per hour is insufficient, then the tendency of uh, the virus accumulating in the room will be high. So these are the things that um, is yet to be mentioned uh, appropriately. Uh, it's, it's just a, a brief uh, information, but uh, not specifically spelled out in terms of guidelines uh, and whatnot uh, for classrooms and even offices. What are the exact uh, good ventilation as defined by the guidelines? So now more than ever, we are in the need to, you know, to, to make sure that we have a widespread research collaboration. It's not a sole scientist. It's not just basically from medic it's not just basically from engineering it has to be an interdisciplinary it we, we all have to you know um, be together and you know sit together to be able to come up with a solution uh to uh, to resolve this matter because it's not a one a single discipline but it's dealing with a lot of issues even in fact in science social sciences and in and in you know many areas that uh, that can actually affect because um, this has actually is a medical problem, but it gives a, a societal uh, consequences where you get mental health, you have problems with mental health, uh, people with um, uh, with um, uh, uh, you know with a very uh, low self-confidence uh, and also those with poverty how do they manage all these things uh, losing their jobs and uh, psychologically economically aspects all these things will have to be looked into so that uh, we can actually see what's happening and to help everybody in, in the community so the, uh, so then we have to make sure that you know with the interdisciplinary action we are able to safe return to normal which i'm not sure when but i hope we're not going to be in the endemic uh, uh, for a long, long time, uh, although it is being told that it's going to be for a long time, but we hope that we can do something to overcome this so that we can get back our normal lives and to be teaching, uh, you know, freely without the mask and uh, not, not being suffocated with a mask, uh, teaching for two hours uh, straight. And it's something that, you know, um, giving a social distancing, especially when you want to do some quick session with the students, you normally sit very near and you, you know, you tend to guide the students at a very near uh, distance. But now with this, uh, this uh, pandemic, it's very difficult for us to actually do our job as best as possible to be a good lecturer, to guide the students, you know, at a, a long distance, you know, especially when you want to do some quick session in terms of design and whatnot. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary actions from different disciplines that can actually uh, work together, especially in mathematics and computer science. We know that uh, they're good in mathematics and predicting and controlling present and future epidemics. Physics, chemistry and material sciences uh, will also, uh, you know, do uh, their uh, Part in terms of designing the PPE, the disposable gloves, and how we can actually reduce the waste management because we know that ever since the COVID-19, the waste management of plastics, uh, you know, the, the microplastics issues are uh, occurring uh, quite uh, heavily. So these are the things that we could also look into. And um, of course, medical and biological sciences, we are all relying on you to be to have these effective vaccines so that we will be safe uh, forever, I hope, and also re reliable and accurate testing kits. So these are interdisciplinary actions, which I think at this point of time, um, we as researchers in UM, uh, uh, would be, you know, uh, a good, uh, this is a good platform for us to collaborate uh, with each other to ensure that, you know, we should be safe to normal again in a few years time. So, uh, being um, in a background of a built environment and also, you know, uh, quite similar to engineering, we involved with buildings. So, we don't really go into the uh, kind of um, sciences of medical science like vaccines or whatnot, but it relates more of the building, the spaces uh, or the kind of whatever environment that uh, 
all the peoples are living in. So it we also play quite a heavy part in terms of ensuring that we are in a safe environment, especially looking to the ventilation strategies. If the ventilation in the room where people are sitting in is poor, then the tendency of the COVID virus to spread in the environment is definitely uh, very high. And also looking into physical environment, I've also got a um, I've also done a research and uh, in terms of physical environment setting in hospitals um, earlier on, where we understand the healthcare workers, uh, doctors, uh, and the nurses are all working really hard. Are the physical environments, uh, you know, uh, sufficient for them? We normally look into uh, the patients, but do we actually look into the health and well-being of our doctors and our nurses or our frontliners? Do we have proper proper space for them to rest? Where, or uh, do 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 we have some you know kind of physical environment that could relate to therapeutic environment? Because these are normally being uh, used for patients. But what we uh, forget is that we need the healthcare workers and we need the frontliners to be healthy. Then only they will be able to assist those who are sick. So these are the, uh, the part where it is very important for us to look into, especially in hospitals, about the physical environment factors. Are the lighting sufficient? Are the you know are the noise? Uh, is it too noisy? Um, do you have do they have landscape for you know like a therapeutic gardens for healing? Uh, at least if they're too stressed working, do they have a place to go to just uh, you know uh, release some stress to be a bit uh, to be uh, at, at peace or something? So the colors, all these are actually very important. It looks uh, simple, but it's basically psychologically it gives a, a big impact. Uh, to those who are in that environment for a long time. Um, moving on uh, from there, I think uh, within the built environment, we, we also have uh, facilities management, uh, looking to how service delivery in terms of um, uh, spatial context, in terms of how far, you know, when especially when, um, when dealing with uh, patients, how long do the patients have to wait, and then delivery in terms of uh, the nurse getting the uh, the the what they call the medicine to the patients. All these are also very important in terms of uh, trying to get everything intact so that uh, you know we uh, we improve the well-being and productivity of a workplace. And also in terms of designing, I think uh, whether or not the hospitals design are uh, are good uh, not to say good enough, but uh, will it actually impact the working uh, walking distance? Sometimes if you actually do um, measurements on the uh, walking of nurses in a day, you will see, you will be surprised that, you know, nurses and doctors actually work uh, like a long miles or, you know, a, a long way uh, from uh, from the day to the uh, to the end of their working shift because they keep on walking, you know, uh, at a long distance due to some um, uh, faulty in terms of design or whatnot, which is which did, was not being looked into in the design planning. And uh, and the mechanical uh, ventilation, this is where engineering comes in. And, you know, when, when we talk about ventilation, you need to rethink about ventilation for our building, for our classrooms, and also for our workplaces, in especially in Simlaya. So uh, I know that the, uh, recently the UM Living Lab it has just been announced. So I think this would be a very good opportunity for us to actually collaborate between uh, you know different faculties, looking into how we can actually um, get UM uh, to be in a safer place, a safer workplace, especially in the classrooms where we have a bigger number of students. Uh, we, uh, are the you know ventilation sufficient? Are the supply and the uh, extractor working fine? Are they uh, are the air change rate per hour uh, you know good enough? Are they achieving the uh, the actual standards or not? But the problem is that you know while the pandemic happens, uh, I face a problem when we need to do you know uh, on site measurement. It's quite difficult to actually get permission to do an on site uh, measurements, uh, which things I think are. Uh, I really regret regret because it's something that you know you can actually know what's happening so that we can help. But in certain uh, circumstances, I think uh, you know there's a lot of private and confidential thing, so we can't actually do um, physical or on-site measurements. So that's where I think uh, the mechanical engineering should come in to help us uh, with the 
you know, with the um, uh, finding solutions for a better classrooms uh, design uh, by having the simulation. Of course, uh, you know, some of us uh, understand about computational fluid dynamics. I did this computational fluid dynamics during my PhD, but, uh, you know, we don't really learn in, uh, on fluid dynamics. So uh, the collaboration and interactions, uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, research uh, would be very uh, good in this um, in this uh, position where we can actually work hand in hand to improve uh, the facilities of Ustimlaya and to ensure that uh, the students are safe, we are safe, and all the UM community are safe uh, within our indoor environment. So uh, mm -hmm. I. Uh, before I end, I would like to show you a video so that you understand, uh, you know, how um, the actually the virus are actually moving. Because when you understand and when you are able to analyze and visualize, you tend to be more scared and you, you tend to be paranoid a bit so that uh, you don't re you don't just go anywhere without thinking whether you're safe or not. So this is just uh, to end my slide and uh, <coughs> to show you how and to visualize what's happening when you talk. We can see small particles that seem to glitter floating through the air. These particles are all smaller than 10 micrometers or one one hundredth of a millimeter in diameter. Let's take a look from a different angle. They're small and light. You can see them drifting through the air. These are micro droplets. People generate a lot of micro droplets when they talk loudly. The droplets between these two stay where they are. They don't drift away. <coughs> a person coughs once and spreads about 100,000 droplets. Large droplets are shown in blue and green. Most of these fall to the ground within one minute. But the micro droplets shown in red continue to drift. <coughs> this simulation uses only micro droplets. Five minutes later, 10 minutes later, Twenty minutes later, the micro droplets are still floating in place. When you open a window, micro droplets are quickly swept away. They're very small and light so any airflow will get rid of them. Okay, so with that, um, thank you for listening and I hope this presentation is beneficial for you guys. And yep, and uh, hopefully that we can have some uh, collaborators from engineering and also from other faculties uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hayati. Um, I think it's a good idea to actually think, uh, to rethink about the ventilation in UM especially. Yeah, especially because, you know, the semester has started. It's now in week six. So we, it's actually a good idea to look into it. Um, okay, so next, uh, before we move on to our third speaker, so please stay with, with us um, until the end of the session for the Q&A session, yeah, Dr. Hayati? All right, so now I would like to invite our third speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Ruslan bin Muhammad Noor, a professor at the Department of Islamic History and Civilization, Academic of Islamic Studies, University of Malaya. And currently he is the head of the department for a second time, started from April 2020. He was the Deputy Director, Research and Development at the Academy of Islamic Studies from 1st July 2012 to 20th January 2019. So he is actually interested, involved and has involved a lot in the Islamic Jerusalem Studies, the Middle East, 
uh, Islam and Multicultural Muslim Affairs, Re Religious Studies and Civilization. He has published several academic articles in International Referee Journal. So he also had received a prestigious award, Anugrah Academic Negara, AAN in 2018 for book category. So his book entitled Conflict Gaza and Misi Kemanusiaan, Freedom Flotilla, uh, was recently published by UM Press in 2020. So he was appointed as a member of Federal Territory Islamic Religious Council, M uh, MAWIP, for the period of 2021 to 2024. And he is also active uh, involving in community service uh, since 2012 until now as Nazi or chairman of Masjid al Mukarramah Kuala Lumpur. So um, without further ado, uh, Dr. Ruslan, saya jemput Dr. Ruslan untuk membentangkan sedikit sebanyak mengenai um, isu COVID. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Siti Nadia. Mm, my respected uh, fellows, um, Datuk Awang and uh, Associate Professor Dr. Nohayati. Um, <coughs> let me share my slides first. Okay. All right. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I feel honored uh, actually to be here uh, this morning to share with everyone about the uh, my point of view on the COVID-19. I put it from Islamic perspective. Um, I think um, this city Nadia has already um, introduced myself about this one, but I just would like to add on that I was uh, recently appointed as the advisor of uh, the um, for the department uh, prime minister department for the hal ehwal agama for the minister of religious affairs. Uh, started uh, from 1st October 2021. Actually, this is uh, for the second time um, I was appointed as the advisor. Uh, last year, I was also appointed as the advisor for the previous uh, Minister of uh, the Religious Affairs of Malaysia. Uh, so we involved in uh, um, doing some uh, uh, planning for the um, uh, Religious Affairs uh, Minister. Uh, which we follow the um, idea of the minister that he wanted to focus on the five initiative that we call it as mantap. Right? Uh, mantap. The first one is uh, the pemantapan mental jasmani and rohani, the strengthening of the mental health. Um, and then the second one is the pemantapan system pendidikan Islam, strengthening of the Islamic education. Uh, pemantapan institusi kekeluargaan, social and community Islam. The fourth one, pemantapan institusi masjid and surau. And the fifth one is the pemantapan socio-economy umat. Which uh, these uh, five are coming from the idea of the minister. And we help um, the minister and the minister office to um, uh, uh, they, they, to have this planning and to have how to uh, make sure that uh, the idea is being implemented on the ground. So we identified several uh, Islamic agencies to work with. Uh, for instance, the initiative uh, one, uh, it has been identified that uh, the leader of this initiative is uh, uh, Jakim, and then uh, the second one, also Jakim, the third one also Jakim, and then the fourth one we have Jawi, and the fifth one we have Jawhar. Uh, for your information, there are about 14 agencies under the Minister of Religious Affairs. So these different agencies, uh, we kind of work together with the tagline of Plan Intervensi Agency Agama Mendepani COVID-19, which is uh, in the short form, we call it as Piagam uh, COVID-19. So this is implemented by the 14, uh, 14 agencies under the Religious uh, Affairs Minister. Um, what I would like to share uh, probably a little bit on the COVID-19 from the Islamic perspective. We come from the, um, the two uh, core sources of Islam, which is the Quran and the Hadith. When we talk about uh, the COVID-19 from Islamic perspective, 
we can avoid to uh, look into the text. So the text uh, mentioned in Surah Al-Shu'ara, verse 30 and 31, وَمَا أَصَوَكُمْ مِنْ مُسِبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَ سَعِدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا أَنْ كَثِيرٌ Whatever misfortune happened to you, it is because uh, on the things uh, your hand have wrought, and for many he grant forgiveness. Uh, the second verse is Wama antum bimujizina fil ar, wama lakum min duni lahi min wali yang wala nasir. Nor can you frustrate it, frustrate uh, through the earth, nor have you beside Allah anyone to protect or to help. Okay, so um, we. Uh, uh, have to look also into the um, early Islamic history, uh, even during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The deadly pandemic uh, actually took place in early Islam, uh, but it is of course different with the COVID nineteen. What they have in early Islam is the taun or the plaque. Yeah, is the closest pandemic that always uh, be compared with the uh, COVID nineteen. Um, in one of the um, scholar of Islam mentioned um, uh, he narrates the hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which the Prophet uh, mentioned that wa taun shahadatun li ummati wa rahmatullahum wa rijisun al kafir. Taun or the plug is the shahada, the shahid or matir for many followers, for my followers, and mercy for them, which means that for whoever. Uh, affected by Ta'un and uh, died um, um, because of Ta'un, he is considered as martyr. Uh, for my followers and mercy for them, and it is uh, dirty or azab for the unbelievers. This is, uh, uh, we found it, it is recorded in Musnad Ahmad. Um, also in the early Islam, we uh, found that during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Badina, the plague happened in the year of six after Hijrah, I mean after the migration of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Makkah to Madinah, and also uh, it happened during the time of Umar um, Al-Khattab, which is the second caliph after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For the Muslim, um, Muslim belief that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the last prophet, uh, so uh, no prophets uh, comes after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the one who replaced Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began with the caliph, the four rightly guided caliph. So um, uh, the first one Abu Bakar and then the second one is Umar Al-Khattab. So the second um, pandemic, um, deadly pandemic uh, in early Islam happened during the time of uh, Umar Al-Khattab in Amwas, uh, one of the place in uh, historical Syria. Why I mention historical Syria? Because the Syria at the moment does not represent the uh, Syria during the early time of Islam. The Syria during the early time of Islam is much bigger than the Syria um, uh, at the moment. The Syria, the, the modern Syria, is the result of World War World War One or World War Two. So um, the historical Syria is is much more bigger than that, which comprises of four um, mainly states yeah? um, uh, that include uh, Lebanon that include Jordan and also Palestine. I do not mention Israel, probably some of you may be um, uh, a little bit sensitive on that. So um, uh, during the time of uh, Omar, actually it, it has been uh, um, forecasted by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he mentioned in one of the, uh, he's saying that uh, he mentioned to Abdul Malik bin Auf, um, Please count six things um, in between my fingers. Um, they will they will come um, the day of the judgment. Okay, so six things that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, has mentioned to Abdul Malik bin Auf to count. The first uh, uh, was the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then the second, the uh, opening or the liberation of uh, Baitul Maqdis. And then it comes after that, uh, he mentioned about at -taun. He mentioned about this uh, plug, the uh, deadly pandemic um, uh, at -taun. And he mentioned uh, at -taun Amwas. Eh? Prophet Muhammad SAW did mention about this. And then when uh, it happened during the time of, uh, of uh, Umar al-Khattab, Umar 
um, mentioned to one of his um, um, army um, uh, leader, which is the uh, Abu Ubaidah, who was uh, on the mission to um, liberate um, some cities in historical Syria. Uh, he mentioned to Abu Ubaidah, Ya Abu Ubaidah, Naam, Nafirum min Qadarillah ila Qadarillah. Yes, Abu Ubaidah, because uh, the, the background of the story is uh, Umar al Khattab uh, advised uh, Abu Ubaidah to come back to Medina al Munawwarah because of the uh, pandemic happened in uh, historical Syria. But then Abu Ubaidah refused to come in, and Abu Ubaidah uh, uh, saying that, Are you run away from uh, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then this is the reply from Umar al-Khattab Ya Abu Ubaidah Yes Abu Ubaidah we are fleeing from the decree of Allah to the decree of Allah uh, and then uh, as a result because Abu Ubaidah does uh, not uh, follow the advice of Umar al-Khattab um, actually Abu Ubaidah passed away because of uh, that pandemic <clears throat> and uh, also during the time of Abu um, uh, Ibn Zubir, Abdullah Ibn Zubir, in uh, the year of uh, 69 after Hijrah, it also, uh, there was also a pandemic happened during that time. Um, what is the advice of the Prophet uh, when it comes to uh, this pandemic? Um, it is very clear that uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that إِذَا سَمَعْتُمْ بِطَاعُونَ بِأَرْدٍ فَلَا تَدْخُلُوهَا وَإِذَا وَقَّعَ بِأَرْدٍ وَأَنْتُمْ بِهَا فَلَا تَخْرَجُ مِنْهَا When you uh, hear that a plot is in a land, do not go to it, and if it occurs in a land that you are already in, then do not leave it or do not fling from it. So um, um, when we look into this text, uh, we found that this is uh, the closest concept of quarantine in the modern days and also the closest concept of the movement control that uh, we have in um, our modern time. Uh, so from the Islamic point of view, we, we uh, tend to compare um, COVID-19 to Ta'un, yeah, to Ta'un, to Plot. And then we have several challenges uh, uh, when we talk about this COVID-19 in uh, our time. The first one, I would say that the issues with the new norms, uh, the uh, new norms which um, we uh, know that we have to be distanced, we uh, do not shake hands, we... Um, so, so many uh, things that we uh, are restricted. So this is um, uh, for some it it affected uh, their ibadah or their daily worships. Um, we know that mosques uh, are closed and uh, restricted to a uh, few people. Uh, Alhamdulillah, in uh, um, few months uh, back, um, started few months back, um, we we see that uh, mosques are already open now, but. Uh, still with the uh, limited numbers that can come into uh, almost. Um, the problem also, we have a different management in each state that we have in Malaysia. We have 14 states in Malaysia and these 14 states, they have a different kind of uh, management in terms of this uh, COVID-19. For instance, uh, we take the example of Selangor. Selangor only allow about uh, 500 congregation to come to the mosque. Uh, compared to wilayah, uh, federal territory, which federal territory, they said that uh, it is up to the um, uh, how many uh, how many congregation uh, people that uh, one mosque can accommodate with these uh, SOPs. Okay. Uh, the fourth one is uh, managing corps. Managing corps is also um, uh, one of the issue. Um, in uh, when uh, in early COVID nineteen in Malaysia, where um, we do not know how to um, manage this, but with the advice of Minister of Health uh, and also the opinion of the scholars, we said that it is enough for them to tayamum, yeah, for the tayamum uh, for the uh, that body, uh, and then this tayamum is uh, not on the body itself, but on on the surface of uh, the plastic cover. Of the body okay um, um, but now in some states uh, they even do not do uh, the tayamu they just uh, um, uh, pray uh, make a janazah prayer and then uh, put the body um, to the grave 
Okay, and then uh, the fifth one is the increase of domestic uh, violence, uh, which uh, resulted to divorce. And um, we know the statistic that the divorce rate is uh, increasing during this uh, COVID-19 era. And also the sixth one, uh, which I think we cannot also avoid, is the vaccine. Uh, I mean, some of the uh, uh, Muslims, they claim probably they are the scholars and things like that, but they tend to be anti-vaccine. So this is uh, the issues that we, uh, the challenges that we are facing. Um, our support group, uh, we involve in, uh, um, in the ministerial level and also at the federal territory level. Um, we are um, doing as much as we can to help the B40s, um, those who are affected with this uh, COVID-19, they lost jobs, they lost um, incomes, uh, they, um, some of them, they even don't have anything to eat at home. So um, we know that um, the, uh, some people outside there, they, they do campaign uh, last time, like for instance, they put the um, white flag, you know, outside their houses. So this campaign shows that the people are really affected down there. So what we do is that uh, we uh, try as much as we can to help them uh, with different initiatives. We have so many initiatives under the Majlis Agam Islam Wilayah Persekutuan, for instance, uh, the Federal Territory uh, Religious Council, which uh, uh, I'm one of the member of that religious council. So we go to uh, help this uh, B40, um, uh, the uh, urban poor area in Kuala Lumpur, most of the urban area, uh, urban poor area in Kuala Lumpur, we manage to uh, go and we manage to send um, packages to, to help this, uh, those affected with this. Uh, I'm not uh, going to uh, talk about this. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Awang and also uh, Associate Professor Dr. Nohayati has already uh, mentioned about some of this, uh, why you work uh, in different uh, fields and also the challenges of working with other disciplines. I do agree with what Dr. Awang and uh, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Nohayati mentioned. Uh, advice on this also we have heard. I just want to go to the uh, last page of my slides, which is uh, what is our expectation uh, on this? Uh, I mean, from the Muslim perspective or the, from the Islamic perspective on uh, managing the, the COVID-19 issues. Uh, I think we need to work together with the Majlis Kansamata Negara uh, and also Minister of uh, Health, which uh, they the one who uh, always revising the uh, SOPs, okay, um, as well as to work closely with the Jabatan Perdana Menteri, especially the religious uh, uh, affairs minister. Okay, and then uh, we have to uh, um, live in the new norms, uh, but we hope that uh, the new norms will be revised to be more Islamic friendly, for instance, to give more space to the people affected uh, to go to the mosque, and then the young generation, um, uh, the, uh, apa nama ni? Um, the school people, um, probably we can allow them to come also with their parents uh, to, to masjid, because we know that when uh, something happened, uh, these people, the affected people, they want they, they, they are looking place where they want, uh, they, they can go and where they can uh, do something which can uh, make themselves feel comfortable. So one of the places is, uh, I believe is a mosque yeah, to go to. And then uh, the third one is the opening for Hajj. We are hoping that uh, this year, um, uh, Saudi will uh, give uh, permission uh, for the Hajj. Uh, because we already um, passed two years without Hajj and some people, they are eager to go. Um, nowadays, um, Umrah has already opened with um, uh, with SOPs that we have to follow. And um, uh, they are really um, helping, I mean, when uh, this uh, opening is, uh, is happening. 
and then the uh, the fourth one is the assessment agencies um, need to continue uh, their musada programs uh, with um, uh, I think um, we need also to be uh, careful as well in in terms of doing the musada programs because of the uh, money management um, some of the um, uh, donations I think it's good if the government um, try to come in and do some audit on on the the um, the donations okay and then also the campaign on the COVID-19 awareness um, the Guru Pondo I think this is a uh, they really influence uh, people uh, on the ground if the Guru Pondo refuse to get uh, injection uh, to get vaccine uh, their followers and then uh, it affected yeah? uh, what more now we are talking about the booster um, vaccine right so um, first and second vaccine still we need to uh, encourage uh, those uh, and we need to work also with religious uh, leaders uh, to to overcome uh, the issues of anti-vaccines among the Muslim uh, community. And um, lastly, probably um, uh, we are in the um, academic institution, we cannot avoid to talk about the research. So um, at the moment, I uh, should confess that I'm not involving uh, directly on the uh, research about COVID-19. Uh, but then we do help uh, in uh, some uh, areas um, trying to uh, push for the um, policy revising uh, the SOPs for the uh, Muslims uh, facing this COVID-19 and uh, things like that. So if there is any um, um, uh, research um, um, uh, opportunity uh, probably i uh, would like also to to get involved in um, uh, that kind of uh, things and that kind of research which um, i probably can be um, of any help so um thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk thank you very much again and uh, thank you to the research cluster health and well-being for having me this morning thank you Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Ruslan. Uh, so that's very interesting, uh, interesting information from the Islamic point of view related to COVID-19. Yeah, we usually heard, uh, I mean, information as well as views from the medical part, but it's actually a good uh, view from the Islamic studies. So uh, now we have actually arrived to our discussion as well as Q&A session. So for the participants, if you have any questions to ask our panelists, please, uh, you can also unmute your mic or you can also put up your questions at the chat box. Yeah, so I can read for you. But somehow uh, uh, for a start, maybe I can ask uh, the panelists some question. Uh, so we start off with Prof Awang. So uh, it was actually reported yesterday uh, by our Ministry of Health uh, that endemic COVID-19 is actually far away. So how do we actually need to move COVID-19 being endemic safely? So how are we doing so far from your point of view? Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the question. You know, like, like, like I said as an epidemiologist, I, I don't know why people are bending around this term endemic as though it's, it's already here. Mm. You know, uh, you don't declare Oh, we are in an endemic state. How do you declare it's an endemic state? Europe is going through this spike now, Western Europe. That's not endemic. That's that's <laughs> that's another outbreak, right? So uh, we are not yet at the endemic state. We have to establish what is this constant level before we declare we are in an endemic state. So how do you prepare for it? Well, it's very difficult to foresee uh, what will happen. That's why in my last uh, webinar with the Sarawak uh, State Civil Service, I put forward seven different scenarios. Uh, what might happen? This will depend very much on uh, vaccines, depend very much on the types of new treatments which are coming up. It depends very much on the virus uh, mutations. 
So whether non-pharmaceutical interventions like wearing masks, uh, distancing, you know, uh, movement control orders, those are non-pharmaceutical interventions, will be tightened, will be reduced, and so on, will depend very much on what happens in the next uh, few years or so. It's very hard to say when this will end because I can't, I can't see it ending very soon. The pace of virus mutations has picked up. Um, fortunately, much of the virus mutations has uh, focused on the virus surviving rather than killing more people. So when, when the uh, virus mutations I've been following, there have been thousands of uh, minor uh, variants uh, and virus. The ones that we know are the ones which are major, what we call the VOCs, the variants of concern. What we are afraid are the variants of high consequence, which are the variants which make everything uh, useless, basically, right? So what 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 I was afraid of when the variants uh, came up was uh, was the beta variant. The beta variant has not taken hold. That's because it has uh, a couple of particular mutations which make it possible to escape certain vaccines. The Delta variant has outcompeted the beta variant in most parts of the world. The mu variant has uh, is coming up in in some countries, but there's no sign that it is outcompeting the beta variant yet. All right, but uh, we have to follow that uh, the genome surveillance uh, very closely. So if if the de Delta variant continues uh, with the Delta plus, there are minor mutations which make it Delta plus, uh, for example, then uh, we are going to see a very high level endemic level, you may call it endemic level, very high levels of infection continuing for the next year or two. But whether this will result in more deaths or more mobility remains to be seen. Why? Now there are some promising antiviral treatments which have come up and, and a couple of them are already oral. Previous antiviral treatments have always been injectable. So that meant you had to stay in the hospital. But the new ones coming up, uh, which have been uh, MSD, Merck, uh, Sharp and Dome have have one which is really been improved by the UK. It's called monopiravir. Uh, that's oral. It can be taken uh, as an outpatient. Pfizer has come out with one, submitted for approval, but only at approved. So we, we don't know whether it will be, be approved. Monoclonal antibodies, the, the treatments for monoclonal antibodies also as advanced. The earlier monoclonal antibodies uh, weren't very effective. They reduced the... Uh, their death rate somewhat, but not uh, not not to a large extent. Fortunately, AstraZeneca has come out with a new one, one which has not yet been approved, but it is promising. Single shot, intramuscular injection, protection for six months. So there is there is hope that that will prevent prevent infections rather than just to treat uh, infections. So, will the virus then develop mutations to counter these drugs? as has happened with HIV and so on, we don't know. So research and development has to step up because you can be sure the virus will try to mutate, to evade these kinds of drugs, whether second line drugs will be required and so on. That's why among the many several, uh, seven different scenarios which I put forward for the Sarawak Civil Service, I, I said that we have to be uh, sure that one of them will happen. Lah. That's for sure. So. Are we endemic state yet? No, I don't think so. I don't think we can call it endemic. So I think the Ministry of Health has stopped trying to say that we are an endemic state now because hospitalizations are now slowly rising in Malaysia. Western Europe is experiencing a wave like nobody's business. Australia has already gone into lockdown. Germany is already uh, seeing a wave which is possibly might be worse than last year's wave. So why why are we talking about endemic? You know, we are not, we are not at that steady state yet. So uh, I don't think we should be bending around this term endemic like, like it's nothing lah, you know. Yes, uh, it can become endemic. There's no doubt about it. It can become endemic. But whether we are endemic state yet, I don't think we, we can confidently say that. Uh, we'll have to see what the data says and what will happen. So. What will happen in the future, whether we need to adapt? Yes, we will need to adapt. Will non-pharmaceutical interventions be here to stay? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's very fortunate, uh, uh, Prof. Roslan, that I have been to Hajj uh, <laughs> years ago. I was thinking if I had not done my Hajj, 
I was I was wondering when I would I ever get to do the Hajj in this kind of state, isn't it right? So Saudi Arabia is open up to anybody who's less than 50 now for Hajj, which excludes people like me. All right, I'm, I'm already in a five series now, so so things things will not the uh, uh will, will be fluid, I think, for the next uh, six to twelve months. I can't really say what will happen, mm -hmm. but the the good thing is I think we will we will uh, uh, we will see we will see certain things uh, you know uh, certain changes and I think R and D this is where R and D is really uh, really uh, coming to the fore because it is a global kind of thing. It's, it's, it's funny how uh, R&D, uh, which is mainly funded by rich Western countries, um, is stepped up when the disease affects them particularly, right? Okay, that's why it took decades for a malaria vaccine to be uh, approved for use, decades, because malaria doesn't affect rich Western countries. Okay, it's, it's a disease of uh, developing countries. So it took decades to develop a vaccine, but it took only months to develop a COVID-19 vaccine because <laughs> the Western economies are all suffering because of COVID-19, right? Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> so I will leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. But we have to work together. I, I have to stress uh, that something which has not really been looked into in Malaysia is behavioral research, how people will behave. For a long drawn out pandemic like this, the, the, uh, the, the, the receptiveness to more restrictions to uh, to seeing more deaths, uh, more cases, and all that, it's extremely important. And we, I keep on telling the Ministry of Health people, look, you must really look into the behavioral part because you cannot force people to do what it's not normal for them to do. Okay, like now when you go to the mosque, you pray, you have to be quite a bit, uh, you know, a meter apart, and so on. It's not normal for us, right? <laughs> so how do you get people to accept that, that kind of thing for the long run? It's not it's not something which is normal. When you wear masks everywhere, we are not Japanese, we are not uh, Taiwanese, where you know you get a bit of a cold, they wear masks, mm -hmm. right? Because that, that's their culture. Right? Okay. So uh short answer, we really don't know. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that's very clear. Um, okay, um, uh, while waiting for the participants to actually put up some questions, so I have another question to, I have a question to Dr. Norhayati Mahyudin. So uh, you mentioned just now in your presentation uh, saying that the risk factors for COVID-19 transmission includes crowding, poverty, poor neighbourhood, poor indoor air circulation and ambient air pollution. So what are the potential long-term implications of COVID-19 for the built environment? Okay, for the built environment, because uh, it, it looks into different aspects, into different types of function of the, the building. You know, if you talk about schools and classrooms, it's a different aspect. When you talk about housing, it's a different aspect, especially when those people are the, you know, the B40s, their house are very small. You, know, uh, you can't actually uh, say that you, they have to, you know, be uh, in a certain uh, social distancing or especially when they're being quarantined, they have a room with a toilet. They can't have that. So, you know, these are things that uh, we can only give awareness to them uh, in terms of uh, knowledge. Uh, if you're, uh, if one of your, um, you know, household member is uh, being positive, how do you quarantine uh, in a small home? where there's only one toilet, how do you manage uh, the lifestyle and preventing the rest of the household getting infected? And when you talk about classrooms, uh, how long do we have to wait uh, for our students to be 50% capacity? You know, it's like teaching in an unusual situation where you teach uh, one week uh, with a student uh, physically and another student online. It's not giving 100%, you know, focus to them. So as for built environment, I think uh, we have to look into how we can improve uh, the uh, the indoor space, the space planning, and also the uh, especially the ventilation, because whatever it is, it's all uh, boils back to the ventilation. Uh, we can't open the window all the time when it's air conditioning because, you know, it's going to be 
uh, energy, energy is going to be consumed a lot and UM is going to pay a lot of, you know, uh, utility bills. But we, we have to make sure that our students are safe. So how do we deal with that? These are the things that we need to really look into, which I think is or it is a, you know, something uh, the the UM Living Lab is a good platform for us, for all the researchers in UM to come forward and, you know, to discuss about this and how we we could end this, you know, it's as what Prof uh, Dr. Awang has mentioned, it's not an endemic yet and we want to have it end as soon as possible. We don't know when, but uh, all of us will have to try and work uh, on this together. Uh, yeah, that's from the both environment side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Hayati. Yeah, they are, you are correct. You know, uh, because, you know, we can't, we, it's, we can't actually make sure that everything uh, is well because we are, the, the virus is unseen. Okay, now moving on uh, to our third panelist, uh, Prof. Dr. Muhammad Roslan. So wondering, uh, you know, everything about COVID-19 is negative. So wondering you can actually highlight on the good uh, changes that COVID-19 has brought about. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> the good about COVID-19. <laughs> the bad about COVID-19 is that we uh, found so many uh, people who are go against the vaccine. Well, we have that uh, not big number, but still um, it affects uh, some of us, especially the um, Muslim community. Uh, because they don't want to get vaccine. Some of them refuse to get vaccine. But what good about it is that um, uh, we can be, uh, I think, uh, more close to our family. Mm, um, uh, even though um, we uh, cannot uh, do so many activities outside there, uh, but then uh, we can be uh, closer to the family. Um, this is, um, we can see it in positive and also there are, uh, I think, uh, some negative also uh, when we uh, cannot uh, move uh, freely like before. Uh, as I mentioned in my slides, uh, uh, there is increase of the uh, domestic violence. Um, what I read in the news uh, and also in the reports, why uh, this uh, happened, it is because some of uh, the, um, the reports mentioned uh, because of uh, the, um, I don't know how to put it, the, when, when, when they, they, they are uh, living in uh, such um, a compact um, with their families and no other activities that they can do, um, they, they, they have to um, manage the children, they have to manage the kids and so on. So uh, it gives them um, some sort of stress uh, <laughs> in managing uh, this, uh, the kids. So for those who have uh, kids uh, in school, um, they have to look after the kids and then um, some uh, families, they just cannot cope with that. Um, but then uh, looking uh, again from the uh, positive aspect, um, uh, I think uh, now we know how to uh, follow the advice of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if we were to look from the Islamic uh, perspective. Uh, the Prophet mentioned so many um, ideas about how um, you, uh, you, you can still do your uh, daily worship even though you are not um, uh, in the place where you can find it uh, easy for the, uh, for the uh, place to, to have your worships. So this is uh, this kind of things uh, I think open open up uh, our minds to uh, be more uh, open and then to uh, think about how we can practice uh, better in this kind of uh, environment or this kind of um, uh, pandemic that happened in in all over the world. Um, I think um, uh, there are other. Uh, positive uh, points uh, which uh, we can point out but then um, I think I give it to uh, others probably they can uh, share their ideas 
about the positive things on the COVID-19. <laughs> but then uh, if, if, yeah. if we are focusing on the negative, then it comes our uh, from the Islamic perspective for the anti-vaccines, for mm -hmm. instance. We, we have to work more on uh, tackling the religious scholars uh, to make sure that uh, the muftis also, we, uh, someone said to me, someone told me that uh, there is uh, a case where mufti tried to explain about the COVID-19, but he got bombarded by the questions uh, from the audience and from those who are not willing to have the vaccines. Um, I do think that one of the best, uh, uh, ideas. I do believe in this that uh, vaccine is one of the uh, way well, we we can uh, probably um, uh, be safe when we live in this um, COVID nineteen uh, era. We know um, the statistic what that um, um, Awang mentioned in in Europe nowadays is very very alarming the situation in german in austria even in the uk as well so the covid 19 increase um we face with the um uh, just the people who wanted to make sure that the mosque is open like before they want they compare with uh, uh, the sops to uh, the shopping malls for instance shopping mall we have no limits uh, people can uh, go, <laughs> can come and go in uh, in shopping complex. Why not in the mosque? So these kind of uh, people out there, they are raising up the questions about this. So uh, from my perspective and from our, um, I mean, uh, the uh, the uh, task that we have, we need to tackle these uh, issues. And uh, I think we have uh, to work together in commenting this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Ruslan. Uh, so we have a question, Prof. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Rampal to Dr. Nohayati in the chat box. So the 13th uh, ARC Asia Architect Regional Council of Asia COVID-19 guidelines for Asia is being localized as the Malaysian Built Environment Guideline for the pandemic by Malaysian Institute of Architects. So wondering what is the progress with the guideline? Okay, to be honest, I've not looked into this uh, guideline yet. Yeah. What I've looked into is mostly on the Ministry of you know, uh, the uh, Environment, the DOSH, and more on the indoor air quality. But I will definitely look into this and we'll try to see how we can actually uh, make use of the guidelines and how we can actually give an, uh, you know, implement this in our country. Yep. Thank you for the note anyway. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayati. Prof. Sanjay, uh, since you are here, maybe I can throw you a question if you don't mind. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right. So, uh, wondering, are we now hear long COVID effects, a proportion of COVID survivors, yet we barely understand this emerging condition? Are our healthcare systems equipped to respond to this unseen public health crisis? So, how should uh, our healthcare system prepare in dealing with long COVID? How will this affect employment? Thank you for the question. So actually the question resonates with another question, which is we have been going through the pandemic for I don't know how many months now, 20 over months, yeah. right? We must be more prepared now compared with then, you would think. But uh, actually from the evidence that I get, from, from what I read, I think we're just as unprepared as before. There are a few issues. Number one is the health system has been chronically underfunded. We don't have capacity. So I find it very interesting that recently we are talking about capacity in ICU, capacity, bed capacity. We never had a lot of bed, uh, free beds in the government system to start with. So I find it very difficult when we straight away go to percentages, right? So I think it'd be better to monitor the number of cases, actually, the number of cases being ventilated, the number of beds being occupied by COVID rather than talking about uh, capacity. Now coming to long COVID, long COVID same issue. So you go back to the healthcare system, right? Do we have reserve capacity in our healthcare system to treat these long COVID patients, right? And I'm sure you don't have to be, a G, uh, you, you would straight away say, if we had a problem before, we're gonna have even a bigger problem later on, right? Uh, I, I think that, that that's my, my short answer. 
<laughs> okay, thank you so much for that. So since uh, we do not have any question from the participants, I think I'll just pass the session back to Prof Nuran. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Nadia. I think uh, we have come to the end of the session. It has been very interesting listening to all the panel's uh, thoughts and uh, uh, especially on the issues of COVID and uh, what what is because we are ending towards the end of 2021 and we're moving to 2022. We are hoping for a better 2022, um, unlike what we experienced in the last. I mean, 2020 took us by surprise. We thought we we're going to be, you know, uh, <laughs> the vision 2020 is going to come. But yes, it came with the, with a different, with a totally 360 degrees change. And then we went into 2021, which uh, took us another surprise, especially with Delta virus or uh, Delta strain hitting us. But we are really hoping that 2022 will be a good year and for us to uh, to kind of coexist or with this virus because we do know that the virus will not change. And some reflections from uh, what uh, the panel has spoken just now, uh, Prof Awang, Prof Nohayati and Prof Roslan, I think one of the big things that we need is actually we need good policies and actions that ensure strong healthcare system, especially and socially responsible population in that sense, um, good governance as well as strong political commitment in order to achieve the right balance between all the public health interventions or NPIs, uh, economic survival and social equilibrium. And uh, we also need more uh, transparency in terms of open science and that, that needs to be better understood. And uh, finally, I suppose we need we really need to be prepared to live with the virus or coexist with the virus with whatever capacity we have and to anticipate uh, things that we might not know that might come in 2022. And hopefully we have learned from our experience in 2021 and it won't uh, caught us by surprise. So thank you so much uh, to all for spending your morning with us. Thank you, Prof Awang. Thank you, Prof Nohayati. Thank you, Prof Rosan. Thank you, Prof Sanjay for co uh, having this with us. And we look forward to more sessions like this. So thank you very much and stay safe, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. I'm sorry, everyone. So before we end the session, can we have a photo session? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> right. There's a message but from the organizer. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone ready? Yes. One, two, three. Smile. Okay, another one. One, two, three. Smile. Okay, that's all. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you so much. You. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe.